Okay. Uh, welcome to the UC STEM Faculty Learning Community Webinar. I'm going to wait a couple of minutes for people to log in and get uh, online. And while we're doing that, um, I first should say who I am. I'm uh, Rolf Christofferson. I'm a faculty at, uh, in the Department of Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology at UC Santa Barbara, and I am the Executive Director of the UC STEM Faculty Learning Community. This uh, is a program or, that was uh, funded by HHMI, a, a mini grant, as well as four UCs sponsoring this uh, program, uh, Berkeley, Riverside, UCSB, and Santa Cruz. The program uh, consists primarily of annual meetings of uh, people, of faculty from UCs, uh, and a series of webinars. And this is one of them today. Um, and getting to today's webinar, it's uh, going to be presented by Susanna Honig and Gabe um, Mennick from UC Santa Cruz. And a little bit about uh, uh, Susie and Gabe. Susie was an undergraduate at UCSB in aquatic biology, and then she went on and did her PhD in ecology evolution at Santa Cruz. And uh, Gabe was an undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz in biochemistry and molecular biology, and then completed his PhD in chemistry at UCSC. Both, since getting their graduate degrees, both are um, uh, postdoctoral science education fellows on the HHMI uh, program um, there at UC Santa Cruz. A little bit of uh, housekeeping information for attendees. Um, if you pull your, you should see a slide on your screen, but if you uh, move your uh, cursor down to the bottom or the side of the top, you'll see a Q&A box. So you'll be able to um, ask questions, just type them in anytime you want into that box, and um, Gabe and Susie will be monitoring your questions and answer them um, verbally uh, during the presentation. So either during or after, you're very welcome to type in questions as we go along. Uh, I think uh, that's about it. If you have some issue, you can always uh, send a chat to me. Uh, but mostly we'd like Q&A coming in from um, the Q&A box. Um, and of course, the first question I will answer says, will the slides be sent later or the recording? Uh, both the record, we're recording this and slides will be posted on the, um, youth, uh, the UC STEM Faculty Learning Community website. And uh, I'm happy to, you can see the link there. I'll probably send, it, send around the link when it's up to all the participants so you, you can know where to get the slides and watch the YouTube again of the video. Okay, so with that done, I'll introduce, uh, let Susie and uh, Gabe take over. Uh, the title of their presentation today is Biology 20, It's Alive, Bringing the Lecture to Life with Student-Centered Active Learning Strategies. All right, take over. Okay, are we live? You are definitely live. It's live, okay. So thank you, Rolf. And we wanna start off by thanking a large group of people that have made this project possible at UCSC, starting with the Dean, Paul Koch, and our previous advisor, Dr. Manny Aries, our current advisor, Dr. Strom, Director Hunter, who is one of the intimate members of this group who has been pushing for just a, a total transformation of STEM education. And then Tammy Bai has been working with Cal Teach. And then we have a row of postdocs here, Dr. West, Dr. Marcus, myself, and Susie. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Duncan, who is currently a teaching professor in biology. And then Baldo, Dr. Um, Marinovic, who is a, a professor here, and many, many other people that have been involved in orchestrating this transformation of our large lecture courses into active learning versions of the courses. So <clears throat> the initial 
idea behind this whole project was to transform our gateway STEM courses at UC Santa Cruz and basically take these large lecture classes and turn them into dynamic active learning versions. And we weren't gonna do this in just one particular class, but we wanted to do it across three disciplines, chemistry, physics, and biology. And today, we're gonna to be focusing on the biology. So right now we have offerings of Bio20A, Bio20B, and Bio20C in the active learning format. And Susie's gonna be telling you a little bit more about Bio20A, which will be the focus of our talk today. Hi everyone, I'm Susie. So as Gabe was saying, I was hired as primarily the biology-based teaching postdoc. And today we're gonna to focus a little bit on how we transformed our traditional biology introductory series into active learning courses. And we'll be doing that with a focus on Biology 20A, which is our Intro to Cell and Molecular Biology course. And so just a little bit more about that course before we get into the nuts and bolts of the transformations. Biology 20A is the first course in the required intro biology series for biology majors here at UC Santa Cruz. It really covers a broad span of topics. It covers an introduction to biochemistry, cell biology, molecular biology, and genetics. Um, traditionally, the, the large lecture-based course has hundreds of students, uh, around 400 at times, um, and this course is traditionally offered in big lecture halls with fixed stadium seating. And so in the winter of 2016, um, and also in the spring of 2017, the first sort of inaugural versions of the active learning 20A occurred. Um, these courses were held in a classroom with movable desks and one chalkboard at the front. Um, and the capacity was around 75 to 90 people. And then currently this last quarter, winter of 2018, we had the inaugural version of Bio20A active learning in our new active learning classroom. And this is a classroom paid for by funding from HHMI um, through this grant that actually allowed us to develop smart board technology, movable tables and desks, and so on and so forth. And I was the instructor of record for that course, um, but Gabe and I also were co-instructors for the spring of 2017 with Manny Aries as the instructor of record. And so we're going to be discussing this transformation. And uh, to give you a little bit of an outline for today, we'd like to talk, first of all, just about how you transform a course from a traditional lecture-based large course into uh, a smaller, or potentially not smaller, active learning version. Um, we'll then give a, a few specific examples of that curricula that came from Bio20A. Um, and then we'd, we'd like to end with some common pitfalls, as we all have in teaching um, and talk about how to fix these and even potentially avoid them in the first place. So let's get started just discussing the structure. How do you transform a course structurally? And to do that, in the spirit of backward design, um, many, many of us have become familiar with that term, meaning it's, it's really good to define your goals before you get started. Um, our goals, when we thought about what an active learning class should be, First of all, we hoped that all of the students could learn the content better. Um, we wanted to use empirical evidence-based uh, pedagogy to try to help students learn the content better. Um, but we also really cared about introducing our students to the skills or the scientific practices that scientists use. And so this was a part of our, our goal from the beginning. Um, we also wanted to make sure that all students were included in this process in really a community that fostered equity and inclusivity. Um, and through that, we were hoping that this could be a motivating environment that would increase the development of science identity in our undergraduate students. We felt that if we were successful in meeting these three goals, um, that these goals would help all students, but they would be disproportionately beneficial for those who have been traditionally underrepresented in STEM. And so with that, I'm gonna start moving into sort of our recipe for how to transform a class. And the first thing we started with in Bio20A and in many of the other active learning courses as well, was articulating our content learning outcomes. And so what is this? Um, 
This is basically a statement that describes what students should be able to do with a topic and a concept. And so traditionally, uh, you know, in a traditional class, we may give students a syllabus um, that has key topics and key concepts that we'd like to cover. This could be something like the key topic of Mendelian genetics, uh, the concept of independent assortment within that topic. But this isn't really active, right? So when we're doing an active learning course, we want to articulate what students should be able to do with that topic. Um, and so for this example, your learning outcome might be use a model to illustrate how independent assortment of homologous chromosomes increases genetic variation of gametes. And so whether or not this is your content area, if you're tuning in right now, the point of this is to really kind of transform our goals into active statements so that we can be more efficient when we design our activities and also align them with uh, the way that we're assessing success. So now I would like to just pose a question to our listeners, and that is, what is active learning? And so feel free to give us a response, and we will try to read some of the responses off as they come in. But I, I feel like this question is, a, is an open-ended question, and it really doesn't have a single answer. So what is active learning? We'd like to hear from you, and this is your opportunity to respond to the question. Now, as people are responding, I'm gonna move into how we approach this question in our classes and tried to answer it. So after coming up with content learning outcomes, as Susie noted, we then looked at how we could take STEM practices and basically work the content learning outcomes into a practice or vice versa. So we could also have a STEM practice and say, oh, this would be really good for this content learning outcome. And then, you know, start with that and bring the STEM practice into the content learning outcome. And so some of these STEM practices that I'm referring to are things like using claim evidence and reasoning or generating a hypothesis using evidence to build models, creating and interpreting graphs, translating jargon into plain language, carrying out investigations, things like experimental design, manipulating and controlling variables. And <clears throat> the STEM practices that are here are certainly not an, an extensive list of every possible STEM practice, but this is just to give you an idea. Um, we really got, got indoctrinated into this idea of using authentic science practices in our teaching through a professional development program that's offered through UCSC and um, this program is the ICPDP. So you're more than welcome to ask us questions about it, but we just want to put a little plug in there because it's an amazing program and it's had a huge influence not only on Susie and I, but hundreds of postdocs and graduate students who have gone through this professional development training. And so we've got a lot of uh, responses coming in now, and I'm gonna let Susie read a few of those off to you. So it looks like uh, folks are saying active learning occurs when the instructor has all students use their mind actively in class uh, to discuss or write or think about content. Um, turning students' brains on, I like that one, such that they are engaged while learning material in the classroom. Um, educational pedagogies that are student-centered. Um, and a lot of folks saying where students interact with a concept or an activity. So that's fantastic. Um, and we'll be going through the, the types of activities we use that um, we would hope you agree hit on some of those main topics. but. Um, this, this idea of having students engage with content in a more active way, not just sort of listening to a lecture or watching a video, but really using their own inquiry or their own literacy to drive further learning with topics. So with this model that we're showing you right now, where we take a content learning outcome and a STEM practice and then try to come up with an activity, um, there are many types of activities that you can do, and I think that for a class to be dynamic, you want to change it up and not just have worksheets every time, even if that is kind of your staple way of integrating active learning into your class. 
And so these are some examples of ways that you can do active learning in your lecture or through activities. And I'll just read this off to you really quickly. So you can have lecture-based active learning, which is a really important topic, you know, using your lecture time to make sure your students stay engaged. And the ways that we've done this is through including pair shares where we have students interact with each other, think about something, discuss something. And I think that this is a great way to have your slides be interactive is to have think pair shares integrated into your lecture. Quicker questions are of course a common way to do this. And when you have smart projectors, you can also have slides that are not completely annotated and have your students get up and actually work on the, the projectors and fill in you know, either information that's missing on your slides or add something to a, a figure or whatever. Um, other forms of active learning strategies that we've used, um, we've done a lot of postering in our classes, which is a great way to get groups of students to pull their minds and their creativity together and work on some project that, that is basically scaffolded either by a worksheet or some kind of prompt. Um, speed dataing is a way to get students, you know, kind of comfortable with talking to each other and it's a, a fun activity. I think students feel a little uh, awkward at first when you say we're going to do a speed dating activity and then you have, you know, students basically interacting through, through various interactions, they get to engage with each other and also teach each other. And then worksheets and case study investigations, which might be based on an actual research paper or something of that nature. Um, fish bowls, where you have students actually role playing or interacting somehow to enact a process or something like that. It's a great way to get students to be slightly goofy, but also be in the process of learning. And sometimes, you know, sometimes they come up with things that are very profound. You can have debates, you can have games, peer teaching, uh, concept map creation, and physical modeling. And amazingly, I think we included all of these different types of activities in Bio 20A. So, once you've gone through and articulated your content learning outcomes and you've identified a key practice that you would like to use with that content um, and you've sort of found an appropriate active learning strategy or activity that that would fit with that content and that practice um, you have your base of your class meeting and the way we approached bio 20a was we identified learning outcomes for each class meeting uh, we identified the activity we'd like to use or sometimes multiple activities um, and then a really, really important part of this is to add in some type of introduction to this activity. So start your class with an introductory lecture. It can be an active lecture, um, but I do think it is important to have a, a structured introduction um, and then a wrap up, a synthesis. So after you've gone through and done an activity, make sure that there is something in there to communicate to students what the learning outcome was, um, give them a chance for a clicker synthesis, for example, or even just a few slides explaining what we did. Um, this is important to, to give students a feeling of structure and to make sure that the quality um, sort of control of everyone's experience has some standards so that every single student will have a similar experience walking out of the classroom. And once you've done that, you have your daily schedule. And so this is truly the recipe we use to try to tackle um, each day by day. We did this for Bio 20A, but also many of the other courses we've worked with. And this organization was very important for us in, in keeping our, our eyes on the prize in terms of those content learning outcomes, ultimately. I wanted to just note that a really important part of this, many of you I'm sure have heard of the flipped model. Um, part of active learning is taking time in the classroom to dive in a little deeper and have students engage with the content. But because we don't have an unlimited amount of time, it's very important that the pre-work or the before class preparation students do is emphasized. 
And so we used the Canvas learning management system. Um, we had a, a large emphasis on reading and videos. Um, and I'll just say particularly the reading. I think one of the, the big problems sometimes in introductory biology is that students just don't read the book. And so one of the ways we tried to approach that um, to make sure people were prepared for the activities was to assign reading through our Canvas learning management system um, and then assign short videos. And many of the videos we used were actually supplied by the textbook company so that students were able to see uh, a static figure from the text be animated in a dynamic process. And then we might even use that same figure during an activity on a fill-in slide, for example, so that students were really getting double or even triple exposure to the text. And um, in order to, to motivate this process, we had before class online quizzes on this pre-work. And this quizzing part was not very popular with students. Uh, they, they weren't used to it because we were quizzing them on material we had not covered in class yet. But this is a really great way to make sure students are motivated to take the time outside of class so that those inside activities can be used efficiently. Okay, so we've talked about the structure. Um, we now wanna move into a few specific examples from that red bulleted list of activities that we think worked really well um, and, and give you an idea of how you might use those activities in your classroom. So the first we wanna go into is that of physical modeling. When you're actually having students use physical objects in the class to represent some type of scientific process or organism, um, et cetera. And so you can see in these photos, we used pipe cleaners and beads for a chromosome activity and um, looking at meiosis. We also used protein structure models. And it's really important if you're using physical models to have some type of scaffold in there for the students. This could be a worksheet, a handout that describes what each color means, sort of, um, really illustrates what the model is and helps students work through this process. It can be something that students who are um, really enjoy the hands-on process or are very visually minded, this can be a, an excellent activity for them. But there are other students that may feel a little bit less comfortable with using these three-dimensional models. And so making sure that you scaffold this type of activity with really clear instructions um, and an end goal is an important part. So I think physical models in our experience um, have been really useful because if you have a process that you're trying to get students to illustrate, you can see where potential misconceptions occur. Um, it's much easier as an instructor to nail down areas of confusion for students when you see that they're using a model um, in a way that, it, that illustrates that maybe they, they don't quite understand the process yet. It would be very difficult to elucidate that through just a lecture format. And in biology, you know, in many of the sciences, it's just not realistic to look at a two-dimensional static figure um, to model processes. And so kind of taking those 2D uh, processes and making them three-dimensional, allowing students to put their hand on something and move it around was very, very useful for many of our students. And so if you can do this, um, it doesn't have to be a, a very expensive model, it can be if you have the funding, but even just cutting up some pieces of paper, labeling them and moving them around, um, or if you do have pipe cleaners, that this is a great way to approach active learning. So I'm gonna tell you about a peer teaching style of activity. <clears throat> and I wanna to note too in the activities that um, through the ICPDP, one of the central concepts that, that was emphasized is to include inquiry in the activity. So a lot of these activities don't necessarily give students the information like you would, you know, on a normal uh, homework set or something like that. They involve more of the student engaging in the material and trying to come up with what the discovery is or what the central concept is. And that's again why Susie uh, emphasized that the synthesis is so important. So peer teaching happens to be one of the student favorite activities that we've observed. Um, I think it's just the process of that ability to stand in front of other people and tell them about something that, that it's very rewarding. And hopefully that's why we are all teachers is, 
because we get that opportunity. So in peer teaching, students prepare an explanation of a key concept and present it to one another. And this can be scaffolded with a handout, an image, a video, or a questionnaire. And it's particularly good for reinforcing challenging or dynamic processes, such as motor proteins or things like that. And I, I would also note that, you know, a great way to go about this is to bring in, you know, maybe two related concepts so that, that one group of students can work on teaching one concept or learning that concept and then teaching it to the other group and vice versa. So students have time to put the concept or process into their own words. So you have to have enough time for them to really come to grips with the concept that they're teaching. And this is usually where our teaching team, which is consisted of uh, postdocs, instructors, postdocs, and learning assistants. So typically we have about one to six to 10 students, one faculty to six to 10 students in our classrooms. Um, we definitely have found that, you know, that through this process, I think students have a better ability of, of maintaining that information because once you've taught it, you really feel like you understand it. And it's, it's a little less intimidating than teaching, say, the whole class, standing up and having to present something in front of the whole class. So with that. So now we'd like to talk about two different types of postering. Um, we used postering in our courses quite a bit. This for us really just meant students are drawing. Um, and so I'm gonna introduce sort of a low stakes way to do postering and then Gabe is gonna follow up with a larger quarter long poster symposium um, that we had. And I think that these, you know, whether or not you're teaching in a large lecture hall or you're teaching in an active learning classroom, there are different versions of this activity that you could still implement into your classroom. So the first type of postering I'd like to talk about really centers on using figures from your text or figures from your lecture slides and modifying them so that they are unlabeled. This is an image of a figure provided by um, our textbook company that shows the cell cycle. And in the text, this figure is labeled with lots of words, um, lots of processes, and this version is unlabeled. And so one really neat way to have students recall complicated figures is to give them an unlabeled figure and then ask them to relabel it. Um, you can also start out from scratch from a blank screen and have students do an activity where they're redrawing an entire process. Um, or you can have them draw chemical structures. That's another really great use of postering. But what postering means really is just that students are going to be drawing. And so this is a photo in the active learning classroom of, of this particular activity I've shown you. The students were asked to label different parts of the cell cycle. Um, different enzymes and phosphorylated proteins. And you can see that there's multiple projectors. Students can physically walk up to the board and they can grapple with that content and engage. So it's, it's scaffolded, they're given the terms they need to use to label, um, but they actually have to finish that on their own. And so this is a, a really nice, if you have the ability to do this with a smart board, it can be a really quick active learning activity. Um, but if you don't have smart boards, and even if you don't have whiteboards, we were successful in using postering in the classroom that we used that did not have any of these types of technologies. So uh, I would recommend using the post-it paper, the large post-it paper that you see at conferences. We actually, um, in, a, in a classroom called Stevenson 175, we posted posters all over the class um, and we had Sharpies and students would stand up and they would be given a handout and they would draw um, whatever they were asked to draw. And they enjoyed this a lot. I think particularly in the sciences, there are a lot of processes that are visual that you have to work through on your own. Um, this may be how students are studying, but taking these active study processes and bringing them into the classroom is a key part of transforming a course. And so whether you're using simple technology or more complex smart boards, postering can be a really helpful way, um, particularly to emphasize visual content. 
So in Bio 20A, we had you know, a daily schedule that included various activities, but we also did a quarter long project that involved taking a protein, which there were selected proteins that the students could choose from. They would select a protein and then starting with a study of the protein, they would basically learn how to use um, different forms of software like Chimera to do structure analysis on their protein and be able to interact with the protein in a unique way. And then from that, we would have them meet some kind of small criteria, like produce a labeled structure of your protein that shows, you know, where the active site is and where the, you know, various beta strands and helices and whatever that you want to label on your protein. So we had them basically make a figure using Chimera. And we gave them really nice scaffolded instructions so that they didn't get stuck using the technology, but they could use it to, to actually explore and learn something. And we did the same thing using um, the human genome that, that we have through UCSC, the Human Genome Project. So we let them explore the gene of their protein and look at various um, elements of it, where are the introns, where are the exons, how long is it, you know, all, where is it in the genome? So we had specific questions and then we taught them how to use the software. So it just became more of a process of them digging into what they could discover about their system. And then finally, we had a culminating mock conference with special guests that included postdocs, graduate students, professors. And so it was a pretty serious affair and the students took it very seriously as well. You can see here from this picture that students, you know, were standing by their posters and basically giving presentations to the, the guests that were there at the conference. And this was the last day of class. So it was, you know, a nice way to kind of have a celebration at the end of the class almost. I think the students uh, were a little bit stressed about it, but they absolutely, I think, loved being the ones who were the center of attention, who were sharing scientific knowledge. And one of the really big things about this is that I think students felt empowered by this experience. And from my experience, and I believe Susie's as well, we really feel that students connecting with science in a way that gives them a STEM identity is one of the biggest things that we can do in our teaching. So we really you know, felt that this process of taking a whole quarter to explore a single protein and its origins and its function and all the details around it gave them that sense of expertise and really helped them develop this STEM identity. So I wanna take a, a couple of moments to answer some questions that have come up live. The first is how long are our classes? Um, Tanya said, I have a 50 minute ecology class and try to incorporate peer share, but the short class time is challenging to incorporate other tools. Fantastic question. Bio 20A was a class that was offered on Tuesdays and Thursdays for an hour and 35 minutes. I do think if you have a choice before the scheduling of a class, um, Tuesday, Thursdays for a longer period of time, I believe is more ideal for an active learning class that's going to be using lots of these activities because there is a bit of an edge effect. Um, it takes time every time you delve into an activity and it takes time to wrap an activity up successfully. And it's important to do that in a calm way that allows for synthesis and so you do want enough time. However, that being said, um, I would probably recommend one of our tricks, um, Dr. Robin Duncan does this, is to use a graphing finger and even just showing a slide, asking students to make a prediction. You could say, use your graphing finger and students you know, make a, a visual prediction. That's something that takes 10 seconds. Um, and so there are a lot of active lecture strategies, worksheets, you can plan to have the time to use them um, that can definitely be used in a 50 minute class period. Next question, um, how many different, oh, there's some, there's some pet protein project questions. Um, Marcos asked, where did the funding come from? So the funding for the teaching team and many of the supplies for this project was 
from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. This was an active learning initiative that was funded by HHMI. Um, however, there also have, have been initiatives um, and departmental sources of funding that have, have been extremely supportive for this type of learning. And so um, I, would, I would advise folks who don't have the funding to look into priceless ways to do this, um, things that don't cost money, just making slides more active. You can do that um, using your, your copy budget to make worksheets, but also look for sources of funding within your center for teaching and learning. Um, a lot of times there's grants that can cover these types of supplies as well. Um, all right, so I'm gonna move through. We might be looking to more questions to answer, but I wanna make sure we have time to cover some of the common pitfalls that might occur. Um, and, and how to fix them or even avoid them in the first place. So there's a few ways that an active learning class may not feel successful, may not reach those goals. And today we wanted to talk about just one of those ways. And so one of the most common um, challenges in an active learning class is making it not feel chaotic. Sometimes it can feel a little bit chaotic. And so when you have a class that feels chaotic, what I mean by that is that it might feel really unstructured, unorganized. You might have students finishing at different times. Perhaps there's not a synthesis portion. Um, and so when this happens, it can be very overwhelming for students. It's also overwhelming if students don't know where they should be getting their material. They have videos, they have activities, they have lecture, which one is the most important? Um, a lot of students might ask about that. And it's very understandable um, from the student perspective. And so just a couple tips about that. If you don't have introductions to your activities or you don't have synthesis portions, it's really important to add them in. Um, I can't emphasize this enough. An activity is great, but if you cannot wrap it up for the students and, and synthesize what that activity meant, it can be lost. And so making sure when you design your curriculum that you really go to your learning outcomes first and decide what the most important content is, but what you want your students to be able to do with that content. That's going to help ground you in how to synthesize and how to introduce your activities. Another common problem is that students might be ill prepared. What happens if you're doing a peer teaching activity and some of the groups did the reading and others didn't? That can be problematic um, for a couple of reasons, but one is that students who are, are matched with unprepared students might not get as much out of an activity or, or may be frustrated and feel that that's unfair. Our solution for this is to really increase opportunities for accountability. This means making sure that you have quizzes on material that is going to be used in a peer teaching activity. Um, even if you have not had a quiz or maybe even if you have, it's also a good idea to scaffold this with either a video or a worksheet that, that gives a little bit of the information. So even if students did the reading, perhaps they, they haven't looked at it for a few days. Play a two minute video or give them a handout with a paragraph they can read with their group when they're preparing for peer teaching so that it doesn't really fall all on that prior prep. Um, and then finally, context the struggle. I think this is something that is overlooked sometimes. We as scientists struggle and fail often. Um, and making sure that students understand that it's okay to feel frustrated, it's okay not to know something at the very beginning. If you're using evidence to build a model, you're not going to have the answer immediately. And that frustrating feeling is actually part of, of why this helps students learn. And so letting them know, it's just like going to the gym, but this is brain gym, right? It's something that, that it's okay to feel. Um, and I think just even, contexting that for them can be powerful. And then finally, uh, one problem might be that the instructor or part of the teaching team is ill-prepared and a united front crumbles. Um, and my advice for this is to make sure that your team, whoever it is, that, that you communicate early and often and that you hold meetings, hopefully once a week, with your teaching team to, to really identify problem areas. Um, and so this really means be prepared, but don't overpromise. So active learning classes are, are really a combination of taking charge and letting go. You have to have a very organized structure, but you have to be willing to be flexible with that structure. Um, communicating about if you run out of time, rather than trying to force everything very quickly, 
you can stop and you can be confident with the students and say, we're not going to have time to cover this, but we do want to synthesize, you know, this one part. And so that synthesis will be on Tuesday. Um, however you need to go about that, students know that um, we're also people. And so uh, when you start to feel that uncomfortable feeling that there's ill preparedness, make sure that you're giving keys to your TAs and your learning assistants. Make sure that that preparation has been done um, to try to avoid that if possible. Um, and just to emphasize time management here, being flexible from week to week is really important, but trying to do all of this the night before is just too last minute. So when you're thinking about incorporating active learning um, and really teaching in general, I would say you wanna make sure that you've anticipated some of these pitfalls before you get started. So I'd briefly like to also cover the topic of the important role of the classroom. I mentioned, when we mentioned, the active learning classroom that was funded by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute um, is fantastic. We have this ability to use smart boards, but obviously that's not going to be the case for most folks that are trying to incorporate this into their class. It is important if you are going to use things like um, postering, that students can move around, that they can move into groups, and that they can also stand up and walk around. That's tough to do with stadium seating. However, it definitely has been done. Um, and so it's a barrier, but it, it's not a complete barrier. Students can still work in pairs if they have stadium seating. Um, but really, if you have the ability, it's great to have students be able to move into groups and also stand up and walk around. Ideally, students should have surfaces to draw on. And so this might mean post-it paper. Um, it may be you know, a classroom with multiple chalkboards or easels that you can get in there, um, or whiteboard walls. And then in a perfect world, sometimes you might have the opportunity to use smart boards or perhaps a connection in a, a discussion section that has something like this. Um, they offer a really unique way to integrate postering or fill in the slide activities seamlessly into the active lecture format and that's a real benefit with saving time because when you do that, you can go back to your slides pretty quickly um, and you don't have that edge effect as much. So before we get to the conclusions, maybe we can respond to a couple more questions. And we have one question asking about the pet protein project. How did we select the proteins or did we allow students to select them? We chose a series of proteins and then they could choose from the list. So that's how the selection was done there. Another question is, are the learning assistants undergraduate students who already took the class? And the answer is yes, they're students who typically did well in the class. They may, they may not have taken the active learning version of it, but they are students who go through a pedagogy course with CalTeach while they're doing the learning assistant um, teaching in your class, which is basically a way for them to interact with students both in the classroom and they go to sections as well and interact with students there. So they, they're expected to, to put in about eight hours a week, a week in teaching time. And I think it's been a very rewarding uh, program for the undergraduates. Another question, which I'll let Susie answer is, about the scientific research and whether we've compared active learning to just the traditional classroom? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we are currently undergoing multiple education research projects to look at the efficacy of these efforts. Um, we have one project I can speak to in particular um, is a project I've done in collaboration with Lisa Hunter, Dr. Robin Duncan, and Tamara Ball, looking at the impact of teaching a practice on claim, evidence, and reasoning. This is the way that scientists make arguments. Um, we've used pre-assessments at the beginning and the end of the course to understand if we're able to teach that concept. Um, I can also speak to a study that is currently being done, uh, the HHMI Persistence Survey. We have done surveys in stu for students in active and non-active versions of these different STEM courses. We've asked about perception regarding science identity, motivation, belongingness. Um, we've looked independently at grades. We've also looked at STEM practices um, and the ability for students to be recognized for them. 
Um, and all of that is in the works right now. So we definitely have quantitative efforts um, that we've been, been doing qualitatively. I'll give you a couple of quotes at the end of our presentation um, just to, to show you student perception for some of these classes. But we're all scientists, and, and so we want to be scientific in our approach to implementing um, these, these efforts. But I also would say there is so much evidence that already exists, so many meta-analyses. Um, the Freeman work is some that comes to mind, basically showing sort of this, this demonstrated impact of active learning on classrooms around the country and around the world. Um, another question, let's see. Why should a student who has done the homework and mastered it be taught by someone who has not? Since it is unlikely the, the accountability measures you propose would be able to fully overcome lack of effort or capacity. That's a really interesting question. I think there are moments where students run into frustration if they feel that they have overprepared and others haven't. My answer to that would be it's a learning exercise. I think that you know, if someone has not understood it and you're now given an opportunity to teach it and you have done the prep work, you are learning in that example. That's not just for the other student who may not have done the prep work. That's actually double, triple, maybe quadruple exposure. Um, and all of us who have taught classes know that, that when you have to teach it, that's really when you master that understanding. And so I would say peer teaching is not just for the benefit of the students who may not have understood the prep work, um, it's the act of teaching itself that drives literacy in a topic. Um, and, and you can't really replace that. It's a pretty priceless act to do that yourself. Um, so that, that's what I would say to a student in that situation. Um, another question, can you explain or give an example for speed data -ing? Yes, so um, this quarter in Bio 20A, we did a speed data -ing activity on functional groups, chemical functional groups. And there's a table in the textbook that we wanted students to basically memorize. Um, but to make it a little bit more fun, we cut out sections of the table, made them into cards. Each student received their own card um, that had a functional group, a drawing of the chemical structure, an explanation, um, and an example of a particular chemical with that functional group. And we gave students about 10, 15 minutes to get up and move around the class. And they shared functional groups with one another. Um, they also had a blank table where they had to fill out information for cards that they did not have. And so just by making this a little bit more active, um, one of the things we asked them to do was to come up with their own mnemonic device or their own um, way of remembering this functional group. And so students were speaking to each other saying, oh, I remember this by thinking about the OH as alcohol and, and here's how I remember it, or um, depending on the group. So this is speed data -ing. It's just taking something like a table or graphs um, and making it more active so that students interact in pairwise discussions and they're usually trying to fill out a larger table. They have a goal in that speed data -ing process. Um, question, what if the student teacher is not prepared? That's a problem. And so I, I have tried to make sure when, when I'm teaching a class that learning assistants have keys. That I think is primarily what um, takes a lot of time for instructors to make, but is very, very important. If you can give keys to the activities to all of your student instructors, then they will understand what you're expecting as the answer. However, remember these are facilitators. And so our teaching team, our goal is to facilitate, not to just stand and deliver answers. So um, our learning assistants also take a pedagogy course with Tammy Bai, where they learn how to facilitate, meaning if a student doesn't know the answer, they don't just tell them the answer, they ask them more about it. They have them talk to their peers and they're trained in how to do that. Um, so I would say that's an important question. Okay. And I would just add to that, you know, if, if the student teacher that you're referring to is a student in the class, you know, it's, it's, definitely going to be a possibility that someone's going to explain something wrong and that would be an issue you know for you know who's accountable in that case if some misinformation has been propagated through student teaching the the one of the ways we've dealt with that is by always having a key so that the teaching activity doesn't just get left in the wind but students actually get some resource that they can go back and compare what they did to what 
we perceive as being the correct solution. Um, another question is, how would you suggest making the flipped lesson, like pre-class reading or video, to be active as well? Um, one way I have done that is I'll either make my own videos or choose videos off of YouTube and then bring them into Canvas. And in Canvas, one of the, um, one of the apps that you can use in, Camp in Canvas, it's an LTI plugin, is PlayPosit, which allows you to put like quizzes integrated into your videos. So you can have a video playing and then at some point the video will stop, a question will come up, it can be multiple cho choice or short answer. The students have to respond before they can move on in the video. So that's one example of how you might make, you know, a video assignment be more engaging. And then one last question, how do you recruit for the active learning section? Um, we don't recruit for these classes. We typically allow them to be open enrollment, just like the large lecture class. So students can see that it's active learning, but beyond that, they usually just sign up based on the convenience of the timing or for no reason at all. A lot of them have no idea that they're getting into an active learning class or what that means. But in general, I would say that students come out of these classes looking for the next active learning class. And um, okay, with that, I'm gonna just go through the conclusion here. If any more questions come up, we'll try to respond to them in the remaining time. So just in thinking about forming your active learning class, you know, put yourself in the role of the student, okay? And if you have high expectations, be transparent about what they are. Give students the tools they need to be able to complete their work. Start with small changes and go for, from there. And this is a really important thing. So I've been the postdoc who's been helping with chemistry primarily. And the first iteration of our active learning uh, chemistry 1B, we really went just, you know, on the most gentle ways into active learning. We had small changes where we kind of supplemented the lecture with a few activities here and there and a few changes to make the overall experience more engaging. And then the second year, we've taken that and we've gone into more of a flipped variation of a flipped version of the class where every class we're doing some kind of active learning. So, and then finally, be kind with yourself. The growth mindset that, that you're hopefully proposing to your students to have isn't just for the students. So when we model struggling in our own, you know, attempt at, at, at giving this information to the students, if we do this with grace to our students, they learn that it is okay for them to practice, to take risks, to fail, and to still be successful. So I think that, you know, really having that mindset that you're in this to learn as well, and you're learning from the feedback that you get from your students as well as your experience. And then with that, I'd like to just give a few highlights from students, which uh, Susie and I will read. So one student wrote, I'm so thankful I can finally feel comfortable and truly understand this information instead of just memorizing it for the eighth time. Uh, another student said, the act of learning was insanely helpful and it really helped me understand material more than I did last quarter. I really enjoy this course so much better than traditional lectures. I walk out actually learning the material and feel good about it. Thank you so much. So clearly this is a subset of students, but I would say that in general, the response we've gotten has been overwhelmingly positive. I think students are sort of aching to, to do these types of activities. They want more of them. And just to reemphasize that you can start small. It's, you know, you don't have to be transforming a lecture course into a completely flipped active learning version to use active learning. If it's just one unit, if there's that topic that you know that students are always confused about, just take an extra couple of minutes and think about what the learning outcome is and give the learning outcomes to your students. Tell them what you expect them to be able to do. And if you can align that with the way you assess, their success, it's really more transparent um, and it 
it raises the expectations for students, but it also gives them a transparent way in which to achieve those expectations. So, so here's a view of the classroom. And with that, we'd like to thank our audience and thank uh, Rolf Christofferson for hosting us. And we're gonna to respond to a couple more questions as they come in in the last couple minutes. Um, we have a question that's asking, how do you manage when different groups finish an activity at different times? So that's something that can happen quite a bit. I would say um, one of the, the tips, especially if you have a worksheet students are working on, for example, is to make it longer than the time you're allotting for it. And you can say, okay, we're gonna give some time to work on this, but finish this up at home. Um, that's actually a really equitable strategy as well because there are students at UC Santa Cruz that um, need accommodation, they need extra time. And so that's, that's actually a way to ensure uh, equity for our students and, and make sure you know, we started in class but nobody was gonna finish the entire thing. Um, another tip I have for that is having some challenge questions or bonus questions in your back pocket so that if you do have students who finish, say, great, I've got something else for you, why don't you try this next? And so sort of layering your activities so that there's a, a base layer for what you think will be reasonable, um, but be flexible. If nobody finishes in time, let them maybe work on it a little more the next class um, or assign it to be due later. And then finally, keep those bonus questions in your back pocket. I'm going to interject my own question at this point. I, was, I want to go back to that question about who's enrolling in your class. Um, have you looked at the sort of uh, population of students in the active learning versus the traditional, and particularly things like the uh, demographics? Uh, are they, uh, do they, do they have, do they enter UC Santa Cruz with more units? And at, our, at UCSB, students get priority enrollment uh, by having AP units and things like that. So I wondered if you've investigated, you know, all those uh, demographic characters and prior uh, units and things uh, in terms of, because uh, our students generally would always enroll in the smaller class uh, if they had that option. I wonder if you have any sense of, of that so far, the, the makeup of your class compared to the traditional class. Right. Um, what I will speak to is that we do have two ongoing projects right now to really um, statistically look at demographics in a, in a mathematically appropriate way. Um, I, I don't want to guess too much, particularly about demographics, but um, we are measuring that. We are looking um, and, and trying to understand differences between active learning and traditional versions of the courses. I think your point about the smaller classes is a great one. I, and that's one of the big questions we get. Well, how do you know it's not just that it's a smaller class? Part of, part of it is, um, but it's not enough to just be smaller. I think that the interaction we're having, we have evidence right now that shows that students that are using these practices in the large lecture classes are having the same gains. They're, they're having gains in science identity, and understanding, um, but in terms of the actual particular demographics, I don't know that I that I could do the guesswork no. on that. Yeah, and another thing I was going to interject. Uh, uh, somebody asked about paying learning assistants. We have many, many learning assistants here, and we don't pay any of them. So they're all volunteers. I don't know. Do you pay your learning assistants? That's an interesting question. I'm sure, many people think about. <laughs> we currently have a stipend for them, so they get you know a small stipend. But, you know, I've heard that other schools such as Berkeley and yourself don't pay them. And I think that they have thriving L.A. Yeah. programs nonetheless. Yeah. It, the motivation isn't, uh, uh, it seemed, well, some of them, of course, want to maybe get a letter from at school. That's true. But um, the other motivation is some of them learn that they really do enjoy it. And they keep coming back over and over. And the money is not a driving force to want to be. Uh, and, and it's kind of, a, we made it sort of an honor to get to do that. And then you get all the good students really wanting to do it without a question. Okay. So um, if there are any last questions, does anybody want to ask another question? Yes. Somebody just asked a question. A copy of the guidelines learning assistants might get. 
I would like that too, actually, because <laughs> my learning assistants take a pedagogy course and they have this list of questions. So um, I don't currently have that, but I, I will try to, to search that down and uh, yeah, it's well, basically it, for facilitation. If whoever generated that is willing to share it, I'll certainly put it under your talk as a PDF and I'll post it on our website. Well, with that, I'd like to thank both uh, Susie and Gabe. You, that was a great talk. I love to hear about what's going on at a sister campus. It's really interesting and in comparing what we're doing uh, here. And I'm sure everyone, all the uh, viewers were wanted to know what was going on. And I'd like to thank an amazing uh, view viewers that all had great uh, questions. Thank you very much for coming and listening, tuning in to our webinar. And if any of you have uh, suggestions for uh, other um, webinars or projects that you know about, uh, uh, please send me uh, an email and we'll see if we can schedule an, a webinar uh, on that topic. Okay. Thank and you so, for having us. Yeah, thank you, Rob. My pleasure. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. -bye,